Thank you all for joining. Appreciate seeing a good number on here already. You're at 42 and counting. Uh, I'm going to put you on mute. <laughs> now we got Siren, so definitely going to put you on mute. Um, so for those of you, a couple new faces here. So uh, I'm Shane Barclay, for those who don't know me. Um, and for those who do know me, uh, good to see you again. Um, I started doing these calls a few months ago in absence of our baseball tours, and they've turned into something really fun and special. Um, and uh, today will be no different uh, with Don Nomura joining us. So we're in for a real treat. So now the plan for today. So we're gonna go to Michael West Bay real quick and Trevor. Lucky we have both of you guys on today um, for any relevant NPB updates, any big picture items. Um, then I have a couple announcements and introductions. Um, then we're gonna get to our special guest, Don Nomura. Um, and we should be done, the whole thing should be done within 90 minutes. So, um, let's see, let's go to uh, Michael and Trevor. Let's just get this one, let's do this right away. So, uh, Michael, good to see you. Good to see you. All right, what do you got for us? Um, the past couple of weeks, the only real, um, I guess virus-related news has been that a an umpire at the on the farm level in the Western League uh, came down with coronavirus, and this caused a little bit of a stir in that the powers that be had not really prepared for that <laughs> scenario. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the timeline, but I believe that he came into contact with somebody who had the virus on the 2nd. He found out about it on the 5th, and he was tested then and um, basically started having symptoms around the 7th. So he, he was taking, taken out of the ro um, umpiring rotation in the Western League leaving them with only two umpires for the games that he was that he should have been participating in. So the powers that be are kind of reevaluating how that part of everything works um, as it, it kind of came as a bit of a surprise or a hole in their preparations. Um, otherwise, another hawk has come down with the virus, but is quarantining uh no major disruptions except that i believe that the hawks have um stopped allowing fans into their farm games um and otherwise i believe that next monday or the monday following that we're going to get news about how things are going to proceed into september got it as far as attendance and is yes that as far as attendance goes right now it's still five thousand person limit per stadium got it well if they were unprepared for the empire thing it seems to be right on with how everything has been for the last six months nobody seems to be prepared for what comes always surprises so just keep rolling with it i guess um all right well thanks uh michael trevor i can go to you real quick just to see uh do you have anything to add there you're other npb guy um so uh give you a chance to add in any big picture items you have for the last couple of weeks um, not, not as far as, uh, sickness or COVID-19 or anything like that. Hi everyone, by the way, I'm Trevor. Uh, I've been writing the newsletter for Japan Ball for the past couple, couple to three years. And, uh, it's always fun to keep everyone up to par on stuff, but let me know if there's anything you ever want me to update on specifically that I haven't been touching on. Um, as far as like ba the baseball itself, like, um, I know it's still early in the season, but the Pacific League is getting really hot up at the top. Like, actually, the, the, there's a big gap right now between the top four and the bottom two, um, which is kind of nice in a way. Like, I mean, it's sad to see the Buffaloes and the Lions uh, tanking so bad right now. But the other four teams are all, I think, within two and a half games of each other, including a two-way tie uh, for first, which has been that way for about a week, maybe even a bit more. Um, right, Gabe? You're the one doing the caps. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. The, the Eagles and the Lions have been right up at the top, or pardon me, Eagles and Hawks have been right up at the top for a good long time. Um, and then in the Central, 
Um, what, what was looking like a runaway with the Giants ahead, I think five games on everybody and even more. I think it's kind of uh, closed up a little bit with the Bay Stars going on a bit of a roll. And so I think there's a three-game gap there now. And so any series could uh, tilt that and make it an exciting race again. So it's, it's just good to see that both leagues are um, really competitive. And uh, it looks like we're going to have some really good ball the rest of August and probably into September as well. Well, yeah, one well, of the things that yeah. I believe they said on the Japan Baseball Weekly podcast recently was that the Pacific League, for the first time in forever in August, has uh, a, a few teams below 500 because there was no interleague. <laughs> nice. Right, well, that's what the be... Pacific League beats up on the Central Yeah, League. yeah. Well, it'll be fun to follow that. Um, and Trevor, looking forward to keeping you posted on that. So thank you both for that. Um, real quick, I just want to introduce a few more people for those of you who don't know them. I'm going to start with Andy. So mm-hmm. for those of you who don't know Andy, Andy's a student at Northwestern that's uh, been helping us out. He's helping produce these chatter ups. So uh, you can thank him um, in part for these. And uh, he may jump in. He's going to try to monitor the chat to uh, get any questions that you guys have um, in case you don't want to ask them in person. So don't be afraid if Andy jumps in. Um, And then the other guy I want to introduce similarly is uh, Coop Daly. Uh, I heard someone talk about the Blackhawks earlier, so you got a friend there. Um, Coop uh, is also a journalism student that's been helping us out. And uh, he's been posting some awesome articles on our blog on japanball.com. He posted one today on uh, World War II and lives lost on the Japanese and American sides during World War II and uh, had some other really interesting pieces that he's put up there too. So I encourage you all to check him out. He's been doing recaps of our chatter ups. He'll be doing uh, one of today's too. So he may ask Don some questions to help with that article. Um, So Coop, thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Love you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Other person I want to say real quick, Hello to you. Thank you for joining us from Japan, putting you on the spot here, Marty. Marty Keener is a friend of Japan Ball for a long time, and I'm glad you're on with us. It's good to see you, Marty. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, and, uh, the, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm going to say one thing. I just talk, I had a long talk uh, the day before yesterday with Mike Salomko. And it's a name that probably even all you, you know, baseball aficionados don't know. Um, if you do, you really know your Japanese ball. Now, way back, he played for the Hanshin Tigers for five years, and uh, he was an all-star a couple of years, outfielder. He was scouted by the Hanshin Tigers while he was playing ball for the U.S. Army. And uh, uh, he was invited down to uh, 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 Kansai to try out. Had two of the best days of his life, he says. And uh, uh they wanted him to just play one more day to see how, you know, give him an extra day and make the final decision. He said he knew he couldn't play any better on the third day. So he said he had to get back to the base. <laughs> and on the basis of the two days, he got signed for the Tigers and then became a, a, uh, uh, an all-star. And then interesting about Mike, you know, sometimes I'm asked a question is which of the players that have been here speak Japanese. And there's virtually none that speak good Japanese. Mike Salamko is the only player that I know who really is fluent in Japanese. It's because he already had a Japanese wife when he was in the army and he stayed in Japan afterwards. He opened up a, a, a pot and pan company, a company that uh, with ladies that went door to door, a door to door sales organization. And at one point Mike had over a, a thousand ladies working for him wow. and was extremely successful in that business. But he stayed here. He's had a, he, his home, his wife's home is in Ibaragi. Um, and, uh, he has made so much money that he has a really nice place in Honolulu, which he doesn't go to now, but he just turned 85 and he's sharp as a tech. He works out every day. Still, he's been working out for 60 some years, you know, anyhow, so if you guys come over again, a a great guy for you to meet that's been in Japan his whole life really would be Mike Salomko. Awesome. Well, that's an interesting story. And I will confess, I don't, um, I do not know about uh, Mike Salomko, so I'm happy to hear about that. that I bet. Awesome. I, is there anybody in the Zoom today that has ever heard of Mike Salomko before? Well, Trevor says he had talked to him, so the okay. Trevor is obviously really plugged in. Um, 
and then uh well, because of the tigers yeah trevor yeah yeah, yeah. um but yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And Rob Fitz, of course, says, well, well, I have. <laughs> but that doesn't count, Rob. <laughs> yeah, when I was writing for uh, Baseball Magazine, Shaw, I did several researches on, um, on players from the distant past. And I did come across a number of Navy and Army people who had played for um, Japanese teams back in the 1950s and 60s. I think Mike was the best though. You know, I mean, I don't think anybody else became an all-star and uh, uh -huh. he was quite a, quite a good player and a, and a really interesting character. Yeah, well, that's really cool. Um, thanks for sharing, Marty, and, and thanks for joining on a Friday morning for you. And, and My you pleasure. Too, Trevor and Michael. Uh, one more final introduction. So Marty was the GM um, in, in uh, Sendai, first American GM. We have another guest here with a connection to the, uh, the, uh, um, the team, the Eagles. So Saya Nomura, hey Saya. <laughs> another Nomura that I wanted to introduce Hi, to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Saya Hi everyone. Is a, Saya is a big um, promoter of Japanese baseball and uh, she works for the Angels now. And uh, Sai, I wanted to give you a chance to let them know what you're doing on Twitter. So I think some people here would be interested in it. Thank you. And um, thank you for having me. Of course. Um, Jose Moda, he's a longtime broadcaster for the Los Angeles Angels. And uh, he's also the son of Manny Moda, who played for the Dodgers. We started a Twitter live. Uh, we do it every two weeks. The next show will be next Saturday. And every week we have a guest. Um, baseball related. Last week we had my uncle Don Nomura. And if you have time to tune in, it's hashtag Moda Nomura with the baseball emoji. Cool. Well, I'm sure that some people will definitely be joining and, and I will too. And uh, thanks for joining us and thanks for uh, helping uh, put the good word out there on what we do and we'll continue to, to do the same for you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So uh, one more a couple of um, announcements. I'm going to do a quick screen share here before we get to, to Don. Um, so for those of you who are new, uh, please uh, make sure that you are following us on social media and on our websites. I'm actually working on a website rebuild right now. We're going to combine our two sites into one, so stay tuned for that. Um, the only thing I ask if you're on these calls um, is to please make sure you're getting our newsletter. You can sign up for that at our uh, websites or the URL there, tinyurl.com slash japanballnews. Please make sure you're getting our newsletters. Uh, that's all I ask for in exchange for um, putting on these chatter ups for you all. Uh, the next chatter up, Thursday, August 27th, uh, two weeks from now, Emma Ryan Yamazaki, uh, the director and filmmaker for um, the Koshien documentary that recently came out. Actually didn't recently came out, but has recently gotten a lot of attention on ESPN and is soon going to be available for streaming um, on various outlets. So stay tuned for that. That's gonna be a really fun opportunity to talk um, about her film. And I think that you'll all have the chance to see it before then uh, in various ways. So on our newsletter, we'll let you know how to do that. Um, and then uh, Cactus Jack Howell, Talked to him yesterday, and he said that he will join us on September 10th, the two chatter ups from now in, in a month. Um, I might get a couple other former players, we'll see, but Jack is an entertaining guy in himself, and uh, he was the MVP of the um, Central League in 1992 with the Swallows. He played for the Yamari Giants and for the Angels and the Astros in a long career. He currently is a manager in the minor leagues. So uh, he's gonna be a really fun guest to have on. So mark your calendars for that. Um, and all that being said, let's finally get to um, the, uh, the point of today uh, with Don Nomura. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce him and ask a couple questions, but pretty much right away, I wanna give everyone the opportunity to ask questions um, directly to him. So put those in the chat or even better, use the raise hand feature. Uh, you can go ahead and start doing that now if you know you have questions um, by clicking on the participants icon. Um, and so Don, I'm gonna put you in the spotlight here for a second just so everyone can see you. Thanks for joining us. 
Shane, thanks very much for having me here. Appreciate it. And uh, hello to everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hi to Marty and Saya. <laughs> hi. Hope you guys are doing well. Hi, Don. Hi. Are you in Tokyo? Hey, are you in Tokyo? Yeah, I'm in the States. I'm in the States. Oh, okay. Yeah, how you been? Hanging in there. Good. I'm trying good. to get my basketball players into Japan. The, the Japan doesn't want Americans to come into Japan. I know. I know. All right. So, so for everyone who, um, I know people know the basics of Don's story. I'm going to do a quick introduction just because it's a pretty interesting one and can form the basis maybe for some questions. So I'll try to run through this uh, relatively quickly here. So of course, he's best known for his trailblazing role uh, in Hideo Nomo's transition to uh, the LA Dodgers from the Buffaloes. Um, but his whole story is pretty interesting. So I wanted to just point out some of those, um, those tidbits for you all. Um, so he's born in Tokyo and raised in, in Japan as well. Um, and I mentioned that he's a, a mixed race Japanese and American just because I know it wasn't something that was exactly well received at the time. And as far as I know, it, it had an impression on his childhood, which I'd like to talk about a little bit. Um, he was an athletic and some would say maybe a rebellious young athlete in Japan and then went on to play at Cal Poly in California, uh, played baseball there. After college, he signed with the Swallows and MPB and, and played in their minor leagues. Around the same time, uh, he was adopted by uh, his mother's uh, husband, the late baseball legend Katsuya Nomura. Um, so he, uh, around that time, he wrapped up his playing career and moved to LA, where uh, he eventually uh, purchased the Salinas Spurs in the California League, the Class A California League. Um, and with the Spurs, he had a player named Max Suzuki, who is a fascinating young prospect with an interesting story in his own right. And Don became his agent. Max signed a big contract with the Mariners, and that kind of put Don in the agent world. And from there, he sought to represent an NPB player that wanted to come in the big leagues, which eventually led him to Nomo, of course. Him and Nomo uh, worked the system to, uh, to join the Dodgers, and the baseball world would really never be the same in a lot of ways. Um, after that, he represented a couple more players in, in really interesting cases, uh, complex cases that would be Hideki Arabu and Alfonso Soriano. Um, and all that work led to them really reworking the whole system between Japan and, and the United States with baseball players. So he was right in the middle of all of that. Um, and since then, uh, he's represented a number of other players such as Yu Darvish and Kenta Maeda. Um, and his agency, KDN Sports, uh, represents dozens of Japanese ball players and also a lot of American ball players that have played in Japan and even soccer players too. So that's the uh, the quick two minute rundown. I hope uh, <laughs> did I cover it all enough for you there, Don. Uh, actually, I have a little change. Uh, our Please. company is no no longer KDN Sports. It's oh. uh, Muse Sports USA. We were bought by uh, the music company Amuse last year. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank uh, you. Not bought, but we merge with them. So that's our name now. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And I, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I think that I got that right in our newsletter, but I didn't change my notes. So thank you for okay. pointing that out. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start in the beginning with a couple of questions um, and uh, then we'll open it up to everyone else. So growing up in Japan, it seems like maybe you didn't have quite the typical Japanese experience. Uh, you weren't, you've never been known to be a conformer and you had a different family background. So what was your childhood like in Japan? And, and do you feel that helped form the basis of what your professional life ended up being? Uh, I don't know how my life had developed, but certainly the environment really shaped me up. I think uh, living in a country where I thought was home uh, and growing up in a, a one race nation was, uh, pretty tough when, uh, you know, right after the war, uh, realizing you're kind of don't understand the racial bias stuff, but uh, you're throwing in there and growing in there. Uh, but luckily, I went to an international school where a lot of kids like myself was there. So that kind of helped me also starting to understand how life is and all that. Uh, 
And today I do appreciate, you know, my father, my stepfather and my mother uh, that I was born and raised in Japan. It, it, it really shaped uh, a lot of things and uh, make me to understand internationally, uh, growing up with a lot of international kids. So that was a really good experience for me. Yeah, sounds like it. I imagine it's um, help you learn a lot of different things that by going through and meeting different types of people that a lot of people don't get to, to do in, in Japan. So yes. that's really cool. Um, so short, like shortly after when you went to college and, um, and you ended up playing in the minor leagues in Japan for a little bit, what, so that would have been your first impression of professional baseball, right? And, and yes. what was your impression then after that experience? Uh, it was very tough. It, I, I, and I went to a Japanese high school to play or practice baseball during my high school years uh, when we had three months summer vacations. So I knew the toughness of the, and, and the practice and all that of, of uh, Japanese baseball. But getting into Japanese professional baseball was just another level of toughness, uh, dealing with adults, people 10, 15 years older than yourself, uh, coaches a lot older. Uh, so it was a totally different environment uh, for me. It, it wasn't very easy. Uh, this is not something I, I dreamed of and, and uh, hoping to make a living in. After maybe two years, I thought this is, this is not my place. So if you felt that way, then what what made you want to buy the Spurs event? It was just that you didn't want to be a player, but you still wanted to be in baseball. Yes. I wanted to be in baseball. I got released after my fourth year. I moved out of Japan, moved to California. Eventually I wanted to get back into baseball in some capacity, coaching, um, scouting, uh, learning more about front office, how baseball was run. And I had a chance to buy a team where I wanted to bring Japanese players over so they can get the experience of playing baseball games rather than practicing nine to five every day. Yeah, interesting. So then I, I Mac, of course, I like, can't talk, talk about the Spurs without talking about Mac. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you got in touch with him and, and kind of his story. If I'm not mistaken, you both got kicked out of high school for fighting. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we have the same past. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, and maybe that got us together, maybe. Uh, Mac, I first met him when he was uh, second year of his junior high school in Japan. Uh, I used to coach a junior high school team in Japan back in the late 80s and early 90s. And we formed a tour every year to go down to San Diego, participate at Tony Gwynn's baseball school for about five days. Uh, so he came as a participant from Osaka. Uh, he was very well talented. I mean, he threw hard, he ran well, he can hit the ball. And so I caught him one afternoon, told him, hey, keep playing game, you, you might make it someday. Then, uh, three years later, his uh, coach calls and says, uh, I need a place for Mac to play because he just got kicked out of school. And in Japan, if you don't belong to a uh, high school baseball association, you basically have no place to play baseball. So uh, I said, as, as long as he follows our rules, he can be a clubby, uh, work for the club, practice for the club, and then see how he develops within a year or two. So that was kind of where I brought Max Lukey into uh, Salinas with the ball clean, uh, with the ball team. That's very cool. Yeah, his his story is an, is a is a fascinating one, um, and I'm I'm glad to see that he's still involved in the game in Japan, right? I believe he's uh, have a baseball school down yeah. in Kyogo and and teaches a lot of kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, Question, Don. Don? Yes. Didn't Salinas always lose to Lodi, as I recall? Uh, 
when I owned the team, Lodi was already gone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the other Salinas. Oh, I, I, I had a different Marty memory. Marty used to own Lodi Club, right? <laughs> yeah. Many years ago. We were in the same league, so we, we, yeah, had fun. Yeah, yeah. we had fun. That's a great league, the California League. Yeah, it sure was. When I, I, I worked in the California League um, in my first job in baseball, and a bunch of players, it was their first full year of pro ball, and they were all excited because they got assigned to the California League. And, uh, and they knew I was from California. And they were like, Shane, what the heck is going on here? Because I thought California was like beaches and Hollywood. And I'm in Bakersfield, yeah. Inland Empire, Fresno. Country and Western music is what you get yeah. in Bakersfield. Yeah, yeah but it is which, a cool which, league. Though. Which team do you work, work for? I was with Visalia. Um, oh, OK. I was working for the Diamondbacks assigned to Visalia. Yeah. Nice so. Team. We're just going through the valley all the time, and it's hot, and and uh, not a lot of mountains or beaches. So uh, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny for these guys. Um, Mycelia has a history of being owned by the Japanese. That's right. Yeah. Oh, really? I didn't realize that at the time. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hiroka uh, and his group bought it back in '87. Oh, cool! I, at the time, maybe. yeah, it was uh, it was just bought by a member of the O'Malley family when I was there. So they have interesting ownership history. Yes. Then. After, I think Hiroka, they bought it in. Yeah. Okay. The O'Malley yeah. family. Yeah. Used to be the Dodgers, maybe, at one time. No. They were, I think. Yeah, maybe. All right. So um, thanks for that, Marty. Um, so now we talked a little bit about the beginning. I'm going to go to a uh, couple guests here who have their hands raised and we'll just jump in with the guest questions. Bob, I'm going to you first. Hey, Bob. Hola. So, uh, feel free to say no comment if you can, but years ago I went to the Dominican Republic and as you know, the uh, Hirosh Hiroshima Carp have a minor league uh, team down there and uh, there was an article in Spanish that I couldn't really read and I gave it to my coworker and the coworker basically said, oh, this is an article about Alfonso Soriano. And they interviewed his mom. And according to his mom, she claimed that uh, Soriano had been kidnapped and she hadn't seen him in years. So I don't know if there's any truth to that story or if you just want to say, uh, well, I don't know. But it's been bothering me for about 30 years or so when I read the article. Okay. So I thought it was interesting. Bob, uh, Bob, I don't know the the exact answer to that. but uh there is a Hiroshima has an academy uh operate down in uh Santo Domingo close to San, San Pedro de Macorís that's where Soriano was born and raised but um yeah they take him to the academy they sign a minor league contract and then if they're good enough they'll come to Japan uh so they might stay away for a year or maybe even two years um uh, but I, I, I don't think he was kidnapped. He was basically playing ball uh, either in the academy or in Japan. Um, as you know, Hiroshima has been doing a very good job with developing their young Dominican kids, um, like the uh, Batista and Francois and Mejia. And those were a lot of the release players they re-signed and then uh, they developed them. Soriano was never signed professionally. Uh, so he signed when he was, I think, either 16 or 17 with Hiroshima Car. And um, he was, you know, he, he didn't explode in, in Japan, uh, but he certainly had a lot of talent. And uh, after all, what he'd done in big leagues was amazing. And, and it could have been an exaggeration or some writer uh, really sure. trying to, yeah. But I, I just thought it was interesting and it's been, bothering me for 30 years and then lo and behold I hear you're coming on so I had to <laughs> at least ask it and uh, now you can go to go to bed at night probably better <laughs> well, I've been I've been sleeping anyway so but thank you anyway okay. thank you appreciate it <laughs> you're welcome. It, it seems like, like perhaps it was like a metaphorical kidnapping because I mean th those contracts and, and Don if you don't mind I'd be curious to hear kind of a little bit more detail about that story like it seems like Soriano um, you know, maybe I'm not sure if he didn't quite know what he was getting into or, you know, what exactly came, came, how it played out. Um, but it seems like he didn't really have a lot of options there and it wasn't necessarily a fair situation from when he signed. 
a lot of players sign contract without knowing what they get into. Mm-hmm. So it's important to have agents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think they don't, they don't quite understand what they're signing on to. Yeah. Um, especially the reservation system they have in Japan is very long and tough. Yeah. Is, I mean, he's such a toolsy, like athletic player. He signed with the cart because he wasn't getting any offers from MLB teams. That's my understanding. Yeah. Nobody signed him. Nobody wanted, he didn't actually run well when he was 15, 16. He was very slow. Uh, He had a pretty good arm, but that's really about it. And uh, other tools like hitting power, he had no power. Um, So everybody passed on him and Hiroshima signed him and uh, took him to Japan and, and developed him. Interesting. That's surprising he, he wasn't right. Maybe he was just a kind of awkward kid still hadn't grown into his Probably. body. Probably. Some he guys, was... yeah, some guys bloom later and some guys bloom early and, and you know, it depends on each individual, I guess. Cool. Um, Coop had a question about on, on this topic, so I'm going to go to him. Hey, Coop. Hey, John. Pleasure to see you. Hey, Coop. How um, you good. How are you? Good. Uh, so my question was, when I was reading about this topic to prepare for this, is that the Soriano thing kind of led to a new thing with the MLB, especially for retirement with a new working agreement. Uh, do you consider this to be a major change in the, um, I guess, environment for Japanese players coming to the MLB, and then maybe more so in the Dominican Republic as well? Um, that's a very hard question to answer. Um, I don't exactly think it, it triggered any changes um, because I think it was more of Hideki Rabu's situation that, that kind of brought the changes to the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, Alfonso certainly uh, helped in that process of uh, closing up the gaps and loopholes uh, between the U.S. and Japan regarding the retired ball player. Uh, I wanted to add on to say that, you know, we didn't quietly voluntarily uh, retired. Uh, we were ready to sign if we have granted the winning on the arbitration by the arbitrators in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, he did not win, and we thought he should be paid fairly uh, at the average of what the foreign players were making at that time. But they didn't take that into consideration. So our other route was to retire. And that was the rule of Japanese baseball. If you didn't sign a contract, they voluntary or force you to retire. So uh, he was forced to retire. Um, he need to make a living. And the other option was to go play where professional baseball was, and that was the United States. Interesting how is is using their tool, you know, using, it, it, like, I didn't realize that the, that was kind of the option they all were facing anyways, was retire or play. So it was almost just like, hey, this is the system you set up. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, take it or leave it. If you don't sign, you ain't playing. So, you know, it, is a, it was a one-way street. Yeah. And today it still is. Interesting. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to another question here for, from Zach Wyman. Hey, Zach. Hi, Shane. Hi, Don. Um, Hi, so first of all, Don, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, you are someone you. who I've always wanted to um, get to know more about. I love your Thank story. You. Um, so Thank my you. questions, I have two questions for you. My first one is, um, when negotiating contracts for your clients, uh, what are some of the negotiation tactics you are using and how do you manage your clients' expectations about their new contract? Uh, we collect data on what the, the player's uh, market value is based upon what the, the market is. And then we talk with the player before we go into any kind of negotiations, what the player we think he's worth in the open market or what he's worth based upon what his numbers were uh, from the previous year and previous years, uh, the accumulation of what he has done. 
And it's easier in the United States to come up with the exact numbers because all the data of player salaries and all that is basically given to us and it's very open. Japan, on the other hand, is very closed, so it's sometimes hard. We have to collect some information through newspapers and then uh, word of mouth, what the players are making, and uh, some way we collect data, and that's how we negotiate our contracts. Okay, and uh, my second question is, um, I'm thinking about becoming an MLB PA agent at some point in my lifetime, uh, do you recommend I get certified and how is the best way to prepare for this? Don't. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I'm studying right now. Um, I am currently taking a um, baseball agent course with uh, Oscar Suarez. Okay. Um, he is currently the agent of Joaquin Soria. Right. I mean, college, what is your background? Um, I am um, a master's student from the University of Washington. I just gra I graduated a few years ago. Okay. Um, I, I think a lot of the, the trend is, so you know, a lot of, there's a lot of lawyers in the industry um, who has become agent. They, a lot of them have not practiced law, uh, which means they haven't been to court or, or worked at uh, uh, lawyer's office or anything like that, but they have a law degree, which really helps because you're dealing with a lot of lawyers at the Players Association with the ownership uh, as well. Uh, but I, I kind of tend to like people understanding more of the accounting issue, the numbers, uh, studying um, data. I, I think that's where you want to kind of focus on. And obviously, you have to take the test to become a uh, certified agent. So I think there's a test uh, twice a year, uh, January and August. I know this year it's been delayed, so I don't know when it's going to be taken, but um, definitely you have to take the test. And I, I support you take the test uh, to understand uh, how baseball's run. But I also want you to read a history of Major League Baseball. And one of the best book I read was by Marvin Miller. Um, I forgot the name of the title, but uh, you can look it up on eBay or something or uh, Google. Um, and this will help you how you know players uh, develop, why the union has developed, and what are uh, indeed important things for players uh, to have in the future. A trusted agent who understands the system, uh, who understands the labor law, who understands data. Uh, so that's the new stuff, the data, uh, you know, the spin rates to launch angles and, you know, all this is going to be very important in the future. So those are things I, I think you really have to study and, and learn and and make it into you know piece of your armor to uh, be prepared in the future for representing baseball players. Thank you very much, Don. I hope I answered your question correctly. You have answered my questions perfectly. Good. That that book is uh, it's a whole different ball game. Game. Whole different thinks, ball game. Yes. That, that's should a have, very interesting book. Yeah, I should have known that one off the top of my head. I actually wrote a paper about that in, in college. It's a great book. Oh, yeah, yeah it is. I, I took a class on that. That talked a lot about unions and, and uh, we learned that the baseball players union is one of the strongest unions out there. Yes, it is. Yeah. Right up there with the longshoremen and, and whatnot. But yep. um, anyways, okay. Moving on to Ian. Hey, Ian. Hi, Don. So Hi, I read Ian. one of Robert, I mean, Robert Whiting's books. I think it was, um, I think of Ichiro and it talked about Hideo Nomo and he talked about Hideo Nomo and it talked a lot about how vilified he was by going to America, but then Noma was extremely popular when he did well. Like, did that surprise you that all that hate went away? Um, yes. Uh, and I didn't understand back then why, but as I 
grew older and we see what's going on today in the media market, you know, where the money is, uh, people tend to rush in. And when they saw Hideo uh, leaving Japan, it was all news that they can uh, get ratings on. And once he started doing well, it just turned everything around because they needed to focus on him, get the ratings. And every day it was uh, Hideo's name on the front page of every sporting papers and people bought that. So uh, it was a surprise, but as I look back and kind of look what happened to how the market evolved, I think it was just a, a natural way of media shifting from negative to positive and uh, just the way it is i guess i'm curious in in that process um so the, the criticism was pretty relentless in the beginning um and obviously you had to go through a lot of hurdles and have some uncomfortable meetings and whatnot at what point did you and nomo or maybe it's at different points were you able to finally kind of sit back and enjoy what you had accomplished uh, we never really talked about that, but I think um, this whole thing, I think, really supported him because of this whole negativity that was against him. And I think really helped him make sure that he thought he had to do well just to overcome. And that became a energizer for him and it, it just kept on and on and on and after Hideo I had Hideki Rabu, Checo, Soriano and so to me it was never ending thing um, but for, for Hideo I think after the first year I, I think he was relieved for many things I think people kind of respected him and looked at him differently but Above all, I think, you know, Peter O'Malley played a very strong role in helping and supporting Hidel from day one, from the negative to all the way to the positive. And he basically never changed his position, whether Hidel did well or not. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of people supported him. Uh, even Tommy Lasorda and all the, the people, the staff during that period. That's great to hear. That's that's good. Is, um, in in that during the Nomo process, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you were kind of the first guy to agent to represent a player um, in his negotiations with the team in Japan, and uh, read that you were kicked out of some meetings. Like, how did what was your reaction to that, and what was Nomo's reaction to that? Like, was he having to kind of like who was leading the way there? You know, I imagine it was an uncomfortable situation. Oh, well, I'm kind of used to being kicked out. <laughs> kicked out of school, kicked out of office and all that. So, um, he did all, you know, knew that I, I was not allowed, but he said, let's go. We went in together. Uh, they kicked me out. He says, I'm leaving with you uh, to the general manager then. Um, so he, he was very cooperative. Um, that's the kind of client you want to have um, uh, that can support you and you can support them together. And uh, that makes good synergy as a team. Yeah. Sounds like it. Uh, he was kind of critical, I, I kind of very critical of the baseball establishment in Japan. And I've so the players you've represented since them do, is that a common thing where the players that leave maybe don't like the establishment there? Um, or has, has that evolved or they're not so upset by it? Or were that, was Nomo really just a unique case in that way? Um, I don't think he was uh, not happy with this stat. I think he, his dream was to play in Major League Baseball. He just didn't know how to get there. And because when he told me he was scouted during the Olympics by Major League teams, but he didn't know how to go to the United States. And he, he, the only path he had was to join the uh, NPB then. But he, his dream was always to somehow play in the United States. Um, and the dream even got bigger when he played against the MLB All-Star teams. 
Uh, so his dream was stronger going to the States rather than disliking the establishment of Japan. Obviously, he didn't truly understand what the reservation was, the free agencies, the injuries, and how he was used, and, and all that, and that we have to discuss. Uh, and he slowly understand that the system was totally different from the U.S. and Japan. Got it. Well, I guess I'll reframe that. So are the players, like the more recent players that come over, is there a common trait like of just simply that they wanted to play in the major leagues or like what is usually the, the motivating factor in, in your experience? Uh, I, I think just like in any other sport, any sports, you know, you want to play with the best against the best. Uh, and Major League Baseball happens to be the best on this earth. And yeah. I, I think you want to, challenge people want to challenge and that's how you uh get better and bigger and stronger and and i think uh there has been a lot of players in japan who was good but never wanted to play here and and they had the opportunity to come here they did not come so it's not every individual that wants to come here but uh some of the players that have that challenging thoughts uh as an athlete very competitive yeah yeah, I could see yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. All right, Chad, I'm going to go to you uh, for a question. Hey, Chad. Hey, guys. Hey, Don. Thanks for doing this. Hi, Chad. Um, as you can see, big Cubs fan watching uh, your guy Darvish. He's actually got a number three through five, so you might want to be aware that you might have to be making some phone calls later. <laughs> uh, I don't represent him anymore. Oh, you don't represent I, him anymore? No, no. But uh, well, I hope I, he does it. A question about, about time he should do it. What was that? I'm sorry. <laughs> It's about time he should have a no-no. Yes. Well, he, oh. he's very entertaining with, I think he's up to 11 pitches or something now. And uh, oh, He's unbelievable uh, talent. And his, uh, his personality has really exploded in the last two years, too. And that's been a joy to see. And that yeah. kind of goes into my, my question. Can you kind of walk us through, like, the process of when a player is interested in coming over here, how he approaches an agent or how he approaches the process? And also, has there been instances of either um, a Japanese player coming here or an American player looking to go to Japan where you sat down and said, you know what, you know, while baseball is, you know, obviously you have the talent, you might not, you know, be prepared for, you know, the, the, the kind of the extreme, you know, mental aspect of having to play. Uh, and, and how would you approach that situation if, say, a player, you know, couldn't handle it? mentally going overseas um first of all you know information for us is very important so we would gather information uh from our resources about let's say a player in japan wanting to go to the states um, then we would approach a player and you know and basically talk to them find out and talk about our company, our past, our history, our other players that we have that we represent or represent it. And that's how we get to know the player. Um, there are players that, you know, we know that want to go to the States, but we do not approach him because we don't think he or would be good enough to play in the States. Um, so we, we try to go after the players that we think and we have pretty good scouting reports on, on players that we get so we know you know who would be fitted in to coming over here and vice versa uh, we we get calls because we have a lot of players in japan from the states uh through their contacts that wanting to come to japan but uh not all of them can make it over over to Japan. Uh, plus, some of the teams are not looking for certain players. Um, then we have to just tell the player that uh, nobody's looking for a service at this time. Uh, so, you know, we try to be upfront as much as possible with the players when they ask about their ability of playing overseas, either Japan or United States or Korea or even Taiwan. Uh, and uh, pretty much being honest is w what we try to do with the players. And real, real quick follow-up on that. When a, when a player does decide to come here, 
um, what kind of support system do you set up for him uh, initially? Do you, you know, make sure that there is, you know, family or that you connect them with maybe a local community? Uh, how, how do you approach that from an agent side, but also from, you know, it sounds like you guys care a lot about your clients. So as from like a, almost like a friend side as well. Uh, we want to first make sure what the player wants, if he wants to be involved uh, publicly or if he wants to be left alone. Uh, so we go from there and then basically we try to find the right uh, like interpreter for him uh, because he would need some time to get adjusted. Interpreter that would know the area, that would know the teams, have some experience interpreting, dealing with the press. Um, but those are things we, we try to uh, support him at, support the player with. We also have a staff in our offices in Los Angeles and in Tokyo that are bilingual who would help and support the family if the player brings a family over for their housing, shopping, opening up bank accounts, how to pay rent if they're renting a place, how to pay electrical bills. Uh, so we'll go through all that step by step. And we just don't want to, my philosophy is not to baby them too much because once you start doing everything for them, they'll never learn anything. So I want them to slowly get used to, and that's how you make the adjustment to a new environment and, and, uh, and melting into something that, you know, that, that they have to make their own decision on certain things. Uh, and and melting in with other players, other families, getting know, and I think that's the most quickest way to be successful uh, making the transfer overseas is to get melting into the the society where you're going to live in with, and who you're going to live with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chad. All right, Greg Thompson, you're up next. Hi, Shane. Hey, Don, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank if you course. don't mind, I'd like to just change direction for a second and ask you about your father. When I moved to Tokyo, he was manager of the Swallows, which was our favorite team because we live near Jingu Stadium. And as I researched him and saw his just amazing statistics from his playing career and everything over in the Pacific League, I was just amazed at at the, his durability and his production and the number of home runs and RBIs and everything he had. Can, can you talk a little bit about your father's playing career for us? Uh, it, it, to me, it, it's just amazing what he has accomplished. Um, and I think he had a good wife. Well, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was a catcher. Uh, he played almost every day. He hit uh, 600, 656 home runs. Um, I, I, I really can't tell you how, how he's done it, but I know when, when I talk to him, it, it comes from, he always said, it, it's the hungriness that I had because I came from poverty and I had to make it and all I, this is all I had and this is all I have to give. And if I don't do well, I, I'll go back to poverty and that's the last thing I wanted to do. So he always had that uh, complexity in his heart that drove him to do well. Um, not only as a player, also as a manager, and also as a, I, I think a human being, um, he's, um, I want to give a lot of credit to him because, you know, when he was a manager with the uh, uh, Nankai Hawks before that and became a manager of Yakult, uh, he was using all these datas that nobody even thought of. And today we're talking so much about datas and, and, and everything else. Uh, he was doing it 40, 50 years ago. And uh, it was just amazing thing that he had. And it, his brain was like a computer. Mm. Uh, and he saw a lot of things a lot of people didn't see. Um, he would call out 
pitches. He will call out the runner would steal bases uh, as a commentator on TV and and he would predict all that. And, and uh, he would see a small something in these players that he can, he saw. And that, that's where his genius thinking came in, I think. Uh, and he read pitches. That's how he, he said he hit some of those home runs. And, um, uh, you know, he was just, just awesome genius guy in baseball. Uh, I didn't. I didn't realize he'd come from poverty. Uh, can you talk to us a little about that? Yes, his father went to the uh, was involved in the uh, Shino War uh, and died uh, during the war. So he never met his dad. Uh, dad left when he was, I think, two years old, and then he he died when he was three, and never had any. Uh, the sense of having a father. He has a, a older brother and mom, three of them uh, lived in uh, Tango in the Kyoto uh, area, uh, which is a uh, fisherman's village, very cold, didn't have heaters, uh, no air conditioning. He was working when he was in elementary school, uh, mm -hmm. selling newspapers, delivering newspapers. Uh, he almost never made it to high school, uh, but his brother paid for his high school. Rather than going to college, he went working and paid for Katsuya's uh, high school. And that's how he kept playing baseball and then uh, went with the uh, Nankai Hawks as a um, tryout. And they signed him because he was a catcher from the countryside where they were labeled as guys that would listen because they're from the country and they would not talk back like the city boys. So he said, that's how he got signed. Uh, so was a, he, he's got a very interesting uh, life before becoming uh, a star with uh, Japanese professional baseball. Yeah. Well, thank you. He's a fascinating guy. I didn't realize how fascinating he was. Uh, he, he, he was, he was amazing. He was a great, great stepfather and great person. I really miss him. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you for, yeah. Thanks, Greg. And our condolences for him, Don, as Thank well. You. Um, did you, do you recall seeing him play or at least following him as when he was a player and you were in Japan? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Did you ever see him play in, in person? Yes. I was at most of his games in Tokyo when he came to Tokyo when I was a kid. He used to go to Korakuen Stadium, which is the uh, pre-Dome Tokyo Dome. They used to have a, a old stadium right next to it. And um, yeah, he, I, I used to go there every time. I go sure to spring training. Um, it's just amazing. I'm sure that... Um... People, you would have said someone was crazy if they said you were going to have his last name and have him be your father when you were yeah, a kid. Never, watching. never, never, <laughs> never imagined. Yeah. Well, uh, did, did, can I ask uh, what, did he hate the Central League and the Giants as much as I thought he did? Uh, probably more than you did. <laughs> 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 he, uh, he was more concerned about, you know, the Tokyo Giants having so much power then. Uh, sign, because they didn't have the draft and they were signing a lot of the great players uh, and the Pacific League was always without um, fans in the stadiums so he, he was very concerned about that <laughs> all right, Thank you for that that's, that's all great stuff um, Gabe I'm going to go to you Thanks hey, Gabe. Gabe Hello Don hey, Thank you for taking the doing? time out today my question's around uh, the recognition and awareness of the Japanese game in North America. Although the internet has definitely helped matters, most fans still aren't even aware of NPB in North America until they have an import join their MLB team, like an Otani or an Ichiro, or even someone like a Shun Yamaguchi or Rafael Dolis. All of a sudden, all, everyone in Toronto is Googling Yomiuri Giants and Hanshin Tigers. What would you do to better market the Japanese game in North America? First of all, I wish I knew. Uh, I really don't. 
Um, uh, but I have an idea. A uh, couple ideas. I think NPB have to, in order to survive and to get better, I think they have to start a new league with Korea. Uh, China and Taiwan and have this Asian major league and market that within Asia strongly, import more players from the United States, export more players from Japan and really you know, have a international uh, market where US and Japan can share and have some of the, the true World Series uh, probably the best place would be Honolulu, right in the middle of U.S. and Japan. Um, if if Japanese baseball does not go international, I, I think they'll never see the light in in promoting themselves uh, in the United States. They'll always be secondary. Um, mm -hmm. I think having a quota for foreigners should be taken out. Um, they should bring more foreigners to be more competitive. They should have more teams. And like I said, they should have this league formed within Asia to be more competitive and, and so they can play against Major League Baseball. I'm glad you brought up the, the Pan Asian League because they did have the Asia series back in like the 1990s and early 2000s, where it was between the Taiwanese League, the KBO, the NPB, and I think at one point either the Australian League or the Italian League. Bring that back does seem like a relatively straightforward idea to improve the quality and awareness of baseball. Also be an easy marketing rights for the TV. All of a sudden you have baseball in November and December now to put on television. Sure. Thanks again, Don. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Sure did. Thanks. I think that uh, pretty much everyone in this in this group would love to see a true World Series, and, and yeah, the idea of a of a Pan Asian League is a really interesting one as well. Um, let's hope that happens. Someone's got to make it happen. <laughs> it all comes down to money. Well, exactly. Someone's just got to demonstrate how much money can be made, and then we can do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, Susan McCormick, going to you. Susan. Hi, thank you, Shane. Hi, Don. Thank you so much for being Hi, here. Great to meet you. Um, as someone who is half Japanese, half white American, I'm always interested in talking to other people who are mixed race Japanese. So I was wondering if you kind of feel more Japanese when you negotiate with Japanese uh, owners and uh, baseball executives? And do you flip a switch to an American side when you're talking to American teams? Or does that even come, does your identity even come into play when you're negotiating for, for baseball players? Uh, that's a very um, interesting question because <laughs> Uh, I may have different identities at different locations. Uh, mm -hmm. First, I can say I feel more as a Westerner when I'm in Japan. I feel more Japanese when I'm in the United States. Um, I was thinking that would be the opposite for you, though. Yeah, that would be the opposite, but th that's how I feel. I feel more f foreigner in Japan. Um, and I feel so Japanese when I'm in the States. Uh, when I try to negotiate things in Japan, I have to be consciously aware that I have to negotiate like a Japanese. Mm -hmm. So that kind of puts me more foreigner, I guess, because I come from a foreign aspect in trying to pretend to be a Japanese. <laughs> uh, and then in the States, I do just the opposite. I try to pretend to be more Westerner the way. So I would ask more and more and more in the United States, be more aggressive uh, in asking things versus less aggressive in Japan and try to get around uh, 
for asking something. Uh, so it, it requires more technique, I think, in negotiating with the Japanese people. Uh, uh, it takes longer sometimes. Um, and the States, it's like, you know, give me this, give me that. Yes, no, no, yes. You know, it, 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 it's a lot to me uh, easier to understand. Uh, so J Japanese are very sometimes difficult because when they say yes, doesn't necessarily mean yes, as you probably know. Right, yeah. yeah. You said yes just now. That means, yeah. <laughs> did you really understand? <laughs> so, As yeah, an American, really. yes, I understand that part. Yeah, okay. <laughs> My American okay. side understands. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, sometimes when they say yes, it doesn't really mean yes. And, and so it, you have to go further down to understand. And then you can't piss them off. And, and sometimes they get pissed off without your real bad intention. So you really have to be careful how you handle things, and mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, they feel equally okay as you do. Mm -hmm. And those are the hard part that uh, I kind of learned through my getting old process. But I, but I imagine Japanese players would look, would look to you as, as being more attractive to help them, to helping them get here to the States because you have the savvy to negotiate as an American for yeah. on their behalf. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but still in Japan, I, I think we have to follow the Japanese protocol. I would go step further, but I still have to be uh, pretending to be more Japanese yeah. uh, to get to my point. Mm -hmm. But I will get to the point. Um, if I have to call them every day to uh, get there, uh, I would say it, you know, I, I will call. Uh, and how long how did I it... approach, I, I, would, I would say. And how long did it get you to find that approach? Did you have it with, in you with Hideonomo from the very beginning, or was it something that was like a slow burn up until you know all these years? Um, I thought I did, but when I look back, maybe I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's like a slow burn. It uh, catches up, and then you kind of learn from your past experience. Uh, but I, I can also say this: the younger Japanese generation is a little more westernized. Uh, so you can kind of be a little more direct than the old generation. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of the younger uh, professional baseball people that's involved today uh, come a little bit from a different background than the old ownership, like the Kintetsu Buffaloes, uh, uh, the they're really old school people. And today you, you see a young, much younger people involved in, in the world of sports. And because of uh, more information today with U.S. baseball, uh, I think people understand a little bit more uh, how to uh, interact with people foreign foreign countries so it, it's been a lot easier for me to deal with japanese people and i i think they they still have my image of being a bad guy <laughs> and and i i think they kind of you know uh understand that <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah but it, it's a slow learning process it, it's a change but you know i i I think it's getting a lot easier now compared to 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Yes. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Susan. That was really interesting. I, I, I enjoyed that, listening in on that. And I'm especially, I'm half Chinese, so I appreciate that too. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> um, Eureka Gama Romer, 
I'm not going to put the spotlight on you, Eureka, because I know that you've been on Zoom a lot recently. For all of you who saw her panel on Monday, that was great. But she she wants to know, as an American, like maybe maybe you know the answer to this, Don, but what do you know about like when American agents go into Japan to negotiate? Are they forgiving of their lack of feel, or do they have to learn how to do things the Japanese way? Um, put it this way: if I didn't have if I didn't speak Japanese, things have been maybe a lot different. Um, because I speak Japanese, conveniently, I would become Japanese. Uh, and conveniently, I would become a foreigner. So if you're strictly American Asian coming to Japan or a foreign agent coming to Japan, uh, they respect that as you know, somebody different from being a Japanese. But once they know, like they know I speak Japanese and I approach with Japanese. So conveniently they would consider me Japanese at a certain situation. And then they would say, oh, he, he does this kind of thing because he's a gaijin, he's a foreigner. Uh, so people use that conveniently. But if you're a non-speaking foreigner, then sometimes you get by a lot of stuff. It, 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 sometimes it's easier. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, Eureka also asked about changing subjects here on WBC. Like, obviously, you're a fan of the international game and you want to see more cohesion. What's your thoughts on the World Baseball Classic? Um, It's, it's an interesting event. Um, it has to be, to me, uh, it's a good concept to have a, uh, like a baseball World Cup. But when you look at soccer World Cup, you have people really competing for that win. And when it comes to baseball, it's more like not winning, but just participation. Uh, so it's not 100%, I would say. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of players uh, are involved try to win, but some of them aren't, seems like, uh, because of the injuries and the owners are keeping them out of um, playing at certain games because they're paying a lot of money, and which I understand. So they have to find something in the middle where they really compete for their country and and be like another soccer world cup and if it doesn't then you know then it just be uh, um just another carnival and uh, that's fine too yeah yeah it's too bad that the the teams often get in the way of of the players participating like you can't treat yeah, like but you have to understand they're paying hundreds of millions of course, to these yeah. players and yeah. if they get hurt they have to replace them by somebody and and, yeah. and there's a risk there so they yeah. got to find the right combination of you know maybe having the some kind of thing during the all-star break or I, I don't know you know yeah yeah that'll be a tricky one we'll see yeah, I'll be, we'll it'll be happens. interested to see. Maybe the same person that figures out how to make WBC a success can make the True World yeah. Series too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yumi, I'm going to you. Hi, Yumi. Okay. Hi, Namura-san. Konnichiwa, konbawa. Konbawa, konnichiwa. Yeah, um, I'm probably like one of the um, few here that was born and raised in Japan and the U.S. right now. And But I love baseball since I was little. Um, is there any current NPB players that you would like to see or bring them over? The, any players that you might be interested to work with or see? <laughs> I think there's a lot of yeah. I think there's a lot of players that's capable of uh, playing in the United States right now. Uh, there's always several questions. One is, uh, would the team allow them? 
And the second question is, do they really want to come? And mm -hmm. with the current system they have, there's a lot of freedom that's been oppressed by the rules. So a lot of players maybe wanting to come cannot come to the United States. Uh, there's, I mean, if you look at Olympics and, and all, you see so many Japanese uh, gold medalists. They're very athletic. They're very globally strong, except for baseball. Uh, we only have a handful of players from Japan where most of them are locked into a uh, long year of reservation in Japanese baseball. Um, and they've been playing with the Japanese team and never really making to the United States. But every team, I think, in Japanese baseball has maybe one or maybe two players, or maybe even more in the minor league system that can come over right now and participate in Major League Baseball. Um, name a few would be like uh, Yanagida Senshu, Yana, player Yanagida of <laughs> I mean, he, he's a major league superstar. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, his home runs is great and uh, yeah, um, amazing. So there's, and he never was uh, uh, that great. When, I think in high school because nobody noticed him, uh, but he's more of a late bloomer. Uh, and after and signing with SoftBank, he became such a great ball player. Yeah, and he said in, I think, one of the interviews that I, I think when he was in high school, Boston Red Sox uh, scout was watching him, and he said, yeah. ooh, foreigners watching me, and he got scared or something. Like, he, he's kind of a oh. funny guy, but, oh. yeah. But um, I'm very happy to see him, you know, perform uh, the last um, Japanese-U.S., uh, the game in, in the fall. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Yumi. All right, um, Richard has a question about another player. Richard, I'm going to you. Hey, Richard. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Tsuyoshi Shinjo. Uh, Bobby Valentine was a guest a few weeks ago, and he said that he thought that uh, Shinjo probably wasn't used properly. He was a great defensive player and all that, but the reason he didn't make it in MLB was because he wasn't used properly. And of course, you can say that about American players in major league. Sometimes they're not used well. They go to another team and they're great. But I was wondering what your thoughts were on, on Shinjo and his experience. Um, as you know, Shinjo is a very talented player. So when you talk about scouting tools, you know, he has a great arm. He run, runs well. He can hit the long ball. Um, it's, I don't know if he was used well or not, but tool-wise, he was a major league player. And, uh, he, you know, he didn't get to play every day. Uh, and today, you see, hardly see anybody play 162 games uh, at, at the major league level. Um, so, I, I don't know. I, I think... Um, these are always if and buts, but if he played 162 games, maybe he would have hit 25 home runs and batted uh, two, 275 with 30 stolen bases. But reality is he didn't, and maybe there's a reason why he didn't. And all I know is, you know, you have to ask the manager why he didn't use him every day. Maybe there was something that, you know, he thought maybe another guy would do better on certain days. Uh, Today, more so when you look at data, some players don't face certain pitching or some players don't face certain teams because he doesn't do well or at the stadium. So uh, maybe they had some kind of data for him that he, he do best on certain days or certain games in a row or, you know, I, I have no idea. But he was well-talented uh, athlete. I mean, uh, I mean, he was big strong and you know he had all the talent in the world and I'm at the one year here for the Giants I know yeah so, so, sometimes you know talent doesn't always you know make you successful um, 
I know Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player, was saying that, you know, if you put me on a scouting report with other athletes, I won't do well. I don't run well. I don't hit the ball hard well. And, but I certainly know how to move on, on the ice rink, and that's how I made myself great. So it doesn't always produce success being athletic. Uh, I guess that's the way it goes. Um, yeah, thanks, I thanks, don't know. That, that's a hard question to answer, Richard. I hope <laughs> I hope it's a good enough answer for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, we we have just a few more minutes, so if anyone has a last minute question, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, Chad, I'm going to you though again. Hi, I just have a quick question about. Um, in current major league systems, there's such a large emphasis now on, on youth project, pro projecting and getting people into their system and, and bringing them up a, in a certain way. Uh, do, you, do you foresee this kind of this new trend? It's not even, it's not really a new trend, but it's this trend of like wanting to get people in young, getting them up through their own system. Do you see that as uh, a threat to maybe the Japanese posting system? Do, is there going to be like, is there a revolution necessarily on the, uh, on the horizon as far as maybe a younger Japanese player really kind of testing the system, wanting to get into a minor league system at age 19, 20 and work their way up, uh, especially a pitcher, um, as far as, you know, the, the uh, working with major league pitching coaches and, and a decreased workload? Uh, that's a very good, interesting question because as a lot of people can see, Major League Baseball is getting younger and uh, there's been uh, no shortage of players. Um, uh, they just released probably about close to 2,000 players this year um, because of the minor league system. Um, a lot of teams aren't playing because of this COVID-19. And with this, that said, next year, I think there's going to be 42 minor league clubs uh, closing its doors. So, you know, that, that alone is um, probably a thousand plus players without a job. So, and, and the draft is changing in the United States. So there's going to be a lot of players coming up quick and if they stay, then they can stay for a long time. If not, they're going to keep, you know, bringing younger guys in and out, in and out, um, using the rules to send them to the minor leagues and bring them up and, and so forth and so forth. Uh, that said, and, and you may know this, but uh, Major League has implemented a new rule about amateur players. Um, they, the players... Uh, used to be able to sign major league contract from Japan if they're posted pre 25 years old or less than six years of professional baseball. Now it's, you have to be older than 25 and you have to have six years of professional baseball uh, in order to sign major league contracts. And a lot of the international signings, uh, signing bonuses are capped. So if they don't have a certain, um, amount of money to sign uh, uh, prospects from out of the country, then they're limited uh, to give them certain, you know, 300,000 or 200,000, whatever it may be. Um, so in order for a Japanese 18 year old kid to move over to the United States uh, to sign a minor league contract, it won't be that hard. Uh, number one, if they're looking for a lot of money, they're not gonna get it. Um, because of the graduation timing is different. They have to be registered uh, pre-signing. There's a lot of rules and regulation that, you know, keep the guys not coming to the United States. Those, those uh, rules are up next year. What's that? Those rules are up next year with the collective bargaining agreement expiring. Uh, I don't know if they're going to include that in the collective bargaining. Um, if, if it's going to change because for major league baseball union, that is not an important issue for the union, for the union players sure. about the international draft or international signings. 
it's more about their own labor issues and you know wages and all that so i don't know if that's going to really change um if it's going to change and it has to be changed by probably some kind of lawsuit or something may happen to change that uh, system uh, i personally don't like the 25 year old um six year experience because you take like uh, Shohei Otani, who was you know, top star at 22 years old, he came in here and he hit you know, 28 home runs in his first year uh, and was only able to make minimum and, and, and a very small signing bonus for what he was worth. So to me, that's unfair for the players. Um, so I, I think the market should be open, but Unfortunately, it's not. And how to change that, you know, there's a lot of thoughts of it, but um, right now there's no process of changing it. I don't think it's going to be changed for a while. Thank you. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. Good. Yeah. Well, it seems like. Uh... Max Suzuki is still going to be the only guy I know of that went from Japan and went through the amateur system. And so you have a unique spot there with, with him. Yeah. There's a, uh, yeah. Um, I think there was another guy, Tadano uh, with mm. Rikyo that went back to Japan and played. I think he went, I think he pitched in the big leagues. Yeah. I that's think, it. I forgot yeah, that. Man. Rikyo university. Yeah. Um, we're right at time, but I want to sneak in one question, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Mark, Mark Cantor's had his hand up for a minute. So, Mark, you're the last one. We'll squeeze you in. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, uh, is there an issue about uh, when you're negotiating Japan about the non-confrontational aspect of the Japanese? Because I have found when I've been in Japan, every, when I've had a couple of issues, that be, you know, all of a sudden there's non -com -com there's non -com confrontation, and all of a sudden it becomes hard for me. I just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and I feel like um, I'm going against uh, a a cultural norm. Uh, yes, there's always been non confrontational with, with the Japanese negotiations. And uh, I may have said earlier, it takes time to get around. It takes more time and effort to talk it out things. Uh, it's very difficult because it, it's more based upon not the reality or the fact itself, but about sometimes saving faces, caring for the other, other side and making sure that you know, they're fairly taken care of. And so it's a matter of balance, sometimes comes into a way of negotiations and, and losing face is still very important in Japan. And those are things I learned throughout the years that, you know, sometimes, you know, they may, uh, you know, dish you out, but you don't want to do the same thing against them because it comes out comes back and haunt you some days. So I try to be uh, non-confrontational and try to be more on a quiet, uh, level-headed ways, whether I get things done or not. Uh, but I, I keep pushing it that way. Um, yeah. Thank you. I hope it. I hope uh, it's a good answer for you. It's not easy. That's not how I. That's not how I always did it. But all right. <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, one last thing. Tazawa yeah. rule. I think it's stupid. It was the same kind of rule back in Korean baseball, and when they resigned a player that left Korea they you know ban the rule immediately so i think they should ban that it's just killing a player for no reason he's got the right to go to work for anybody yeah well thank you for squeezing that one in for yeah, some people were asking about that in the chat a couple a yeah, couple yeah. times um and you know it's a good way to end because i was 
of course, uh, you know, you've always been a big proponent of players' rights, and, and uh, it's important to have people like you in, in the game. And uh, I know you said a few times, hope you answered the question well, but I, I assure you answered all the questions really well. And uh, really appreciate you coming on and taking the time. It was really a unique opportunity for us. And I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you very much. Um, and uh, we wish you luck getting through uh, the rest of this weird year and, and hopefully back to normal yeah. next year. Um, yeah, I hope so. Everybody I'm gonna, stay safe. Yeah. Thank you. You too. So I'll give you permission to sign off, Don. Thanks so much. Uh, okay. For everyone else, I have a couple of announcements and then we'll wrap it up here in a couple of minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Um, all right. So everyone, uh, that was awesome. Everyone, uh, thanks for your participation. I'm glad we had a lot of questions there and, uh, and some new faces as well to join us. Um, so just a quick reminder uh, about, please uh, make sure you sign up for our newsletter um, and follow us on social media. I appreciate that. You can just go to our website for the newsletter. Um, and I have to do the, uh, the shameless plug for our um, gift cards as well. I don't have, all right, here's the slide for it. Uh, we're selling gift cards in the absence of tours just to try to keep things going. I'm, uh, investing on a new website and a few things. And so for those of you who have bought gift cards to be used on future tours, I really appreciate that. It's helping pay for uh, things of that nature. Um, so uh, just a shout out for that. Uh, no pressure, but appreciate it. If you're going to be coming on the trip, um, please consider that. And uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to also mention Carter, uh, Carter Cromwell. Um, I didn't mention you earlier, Carter, but um, Carter's been putting out um, a weekly update on our blog. Um, hey, Carter. And uh, he's been doing uh, recaps of how the Japanese players in the major leagues are doing every week. Just a little quick blurb. So um, thanks for doing that. That's been good to follow. So for all of you people who I know everyone on this call has a particular interest in Japanese baseball, they, they uh, follow make sure you read Carter's pieces. Writing it up on the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks for doing that um also uh for those of you who are on the game night our last call a couple weeks ago um sorry i haven't gotten your prizes out there's a couple things holding up uh getting those out but i finally have what i need so i will get those in the mail to you thanks for your patience on that um and uh with that said um I'll give everyone permission to sign off. I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat a little bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks Saya for joining and Eureka um, and all the usual suspects and Diane as well, another newbie. So uh, take care everyone.